Welcome to Chapter 13, Heart and Blood Vessels. This is part of the cardiovascular system. So in previous chapters, we've already discussed blood, and blood will be continued to discuss as we look through this chapter. So we are now in Unit 4, and these concepts all tend to go together. So in Unit 4, we are going to discuss blood, heart, blood vessels. So in other words, the heart pumps the blood, the blood vessels carry or transport the blood, the respiratory system, because the respiratory system has to do with oxygen and carbon dioxide, and last but not least, some lymphatic ideas, some immune system ideas. So before we start our discussion in depth, you should label and submit page 168, the heart diagram from the PowerPoint packet. I would also suggest keeping page 168 out, which is the heart diagram, as we go through this presentation. You should begin following along and filling in the PowerPoint packet on page 160. At the end of this part three, there are three parts to this video series. The third video series is going to go through the blood vessel worksheet in brief amounts. You should do the blood vessel worksheet that is on Blackboard and not the one in the PowerPoint packet on page 170 through 173. This particular part of the PowerPoint has few errors and the one on Blackboard is the most up to date. So the chapter 13, the heart and blood vessels. So this is just a brief overview showing a, a woman, her heart in the center of her body and blood vessels. Blood vessels jobs are to carry blood either towards the heart or away from the heart. It's going to transport the blood, the heart will pump the blood and the respiratory system will help make that blood oxygen rich or oxygen poor. So some functions of the heart include regulates blood supply, generates blood pressure, routes blood, we call this one-way blood flow, which we will discuss when we get to valves. So the heart is a very important system in your body. It is part of what's called the cardiovascular system. Another component of this is blood. We've already discussed blood in previous presentations. You should take your knowledge from the blood and apply it here. In this unit, we will discuss heart, blood, the respiratory system, and lymphatic system. All of those are very interrelated. In other words, your heart pumps the blood, the blood transports oxygen and carbon dioxide needed by your cells, and the lungs and the respiratory system supply the blood. Heart, what is it? It's going to be the structure that pumps blood, you have what are called arteries and veins. Again, you have a worksheet that corresponds with this chapter 13. So this chapter is the heart and blood vessels. And on the worksheet, we're gonna ask you to label arteries. This will also be done in lab. So what are arteries? They are blood vessels that carry blood away from the heart to capillaries. The easiest way to remember this is arteries away, AA. We will discuss this in detail again in the, the uh, worksheet component of this, the blood vessel worksheet. Veins are blood vessels that carry blood from capillaries. Capillaries are very small structures to the heart. So when we get into this chapter further, we will be discussing why arteries tend to be oxygen rich, meaning lots of oxygen, and veins tend to be oxygen poor. Let's continue with our discussion of the heart and its structures. So this is a picture showing the heart and its orientation in the body. You can also see around the heart of the lungs. Again, chapter 15, the respiratory system, will be discussed shortly. So how big is your heart? Your heart is about the size of a fist or a large bar of soap. It typically weighs less than a pound. A pound is about 16 ounces. The heart typically weighs about 12 to 14 ounces. It is going to vary from person to person, but this is the average. Location. The heart is located between your lungs and the thoracic cavity. Remember the thoracic cavity is the cavity in the top half of your body and is separated from the abdominal cavity by the diaphragm and the rib cage protects the heart and lungs. 
Orientation. The heart has an apex, which is the bottom, which you should see in this picture, towards the left. So in other words, the heart points towards the left side of your body. One of the things you're going to notice in this image, and you're going to see continuing through this chapter, is the orientation or the labeling of right and left. And it may look confusing to you. So as you're looking at this picture, the right lung is labeled right lung. But if you're looking at it from the frontal view, you're going to say that's my left. The orientation is always from the patient's left or right, so in other words, from the back. So you need to know where right and left are also an orientation of the heart. This will be very important when we get to opening the heart and the heart chambers. So if you see that apex, is, which is the bottom portion, it's going to point towards the left. This also influences the size of the lungs. In other words, the right lungs, which are three lobes, are going to be bigger and the left lung is actually smaller because the heart takes up part of that space. So now before we get into the inside of the heart, let's look at the heart coverings. The heart on the outside has something called the pericardium. You should recall from the vocabulary list at the beginning of the semester, peri means around and cardio means heart. This is a double-layered sac that anchors and protects the heart. The heart's pericardium is fairly thick because you need that extra protection because it's a vital organ. The pericardium is then divided, as you can see in this picture, into two regions, parietal pericardium and visceral pericardium. These are also two terms that we saw in chapter one. Parietal pericardium is the membrane around the heart's cavity. A cavity is a space. The visceral pericardium is on the surface of the heart. These are two membranes. So in other words, the pericardium itself is the bigger structure, which contains inside it two smaller membranes, parietal and visceral. Another word or term for visceral pericardium is epicardium. And this gets a little confusing. So epicardium and visceral pericardium are also layers of the heart because we're going to be now on the surface of the heart. The pericardial cavity, again a cavity is a space, is the space around the heart. As you can see in this picture, that space is often filled with fluid. It is important that the fluid in this pericardial cavity not contain any bacterial viruses, otherwise an infection could occur. Heart layers. So now what we're going to do is take a chunk of the heart and see what the different layers look like and their functions. Epicardium. Again, you should recall that epi means upon or above. Think epidermis, but in this case we're talking about the heart. So it's epicardium. So it is the surface of the heart. It is on the outside. The myocardium. So myo means middle or muscle. And again, this is one of our muscles, so we're going to be discussing muscle contractions further in this presentation in part two. Myocardium is a thick middle layer composed of cardiac muscle. This is the part that's going to contract. The inner layer is known as the endocardium. It's a smooth inner surface. Here is a picture of the heart and its layers. This picture is if you took a chunk out of the heart and kind of looked at it from a side view, this is what you would see. So on the outside we have our epicardium or visceral pericardium often containing some fat. Then the largest portion is the myocardium, that is the muscular layer that's going to contract. It's going to have things like actin and myosin, which we're going to visit here shortly. And the endocardium is on the inside and it needs to be smooth so that blood can flow through those heart chambers and structures. Heart chambers and structures. So before we begin, let's look at this picture. This picture is a very simplified view of the heart. We're going to continue to see this picture as we progress to the different structures. And the pictures are going to get more complex. So first we have four chambers, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. And what you're going to notice is the right side is going to again look like it's your left, but we're looking from the patient's right or left. You're also going to notice that the atria or atrium, which are the same structures, are on the top half of the heart and the ventricles are on the bottom half of the heart. So let's go look at this in detail. 
chambers. Right atrium, which will be abbreviated for the rest of this presentation, RA. Right ventricle, RV. Left atrium, LA. And left ventricle, LV. These are the four major chambers of the heart. You will need to know these on tests and quizzes. So now let's keep going. The coronary sulcus is a structure that separates the atria from the ventricles. So atria is just the plural term of atrium. Atrium is singular, atria is more than one. So we're going to focus our attentions initially on the top half of your heart, which is the atria. You have two of them, right and left. The blood is going to flow from top to bottom, atria to ventricles, from right to left. As we're continuing through these heart structures, it is important to understand the flow of blood. We will put all those pieces together at the end of this presentation. It is extremely important that you understand the flow of blood through the heart and into the body. The atria, the upper portion of the heart, they're what we call the holding chambers. So blood is going to pool into that right atrium. It will hold that blood until a valve opens that right atrium and then blood will flow from top to bottom. These are small thin walled chambers because they don't need to do very much pumping. Again, they're in the top half, so as soon as those valves open, the blood will flow from top to bottom. They're going to contract minimally to push blood into the ventricles. Again, they do not need to contract very much because gravity will assist with blood moving from top to bottom. Between the two atria is an interatrial septum. Inter means between, atria is atrial, and septum is a division. So the interatrial septum separates or divides the RA, right atrium, and the LA, left atrium. Now let's take the same knowledge and compare and contrast it to the ventricles. So the atria were the upper portion, or upper chambers, so where are the ventricles? The ventricles are located in the lower portion of your heart. They are going to be our pumping chambers. These are the chambers that are going to have to squeeze or contract to push blood up against gravity and get the blood either to your lungs or to the rest of your body. They are strong, thick walled chambers. This is where the majority of the myocardium is located. In other words, this is where the majority of the muscle is located. These are the chambers that are going to do most of the work of the heart. They're going to contract forcefully to propel blood out of the heart. The blood from the heart is either going to the lungs or to the rest of the body. So as these ventricles squeeze or contract, that blood needs to move up and out of the heart. Between the ventricles is an interventricular septum. Similar to the interatrial septum, this is going to divide the right ventricle and the left ventricle. These divisions are just so that each chamber has its own section. So there are four chambers of the heart starting at the top, right atrium, then bottom, right ventricle, then left atrium, and left ventricle. We're going to focus our attentions now just on the right side of the heart. So blood is going to pool or flow into that right atrium. Where this blood is coming from is the rest of the body. This blood is going to be what we call oxygen deficient or oxygen poor, and we will see why. The right side of the heart is called the pulmonary circuit. It is called the pulmonary circuit because its job is to take blood to the lungs. The word pulmonary means lungs. So it carries blood from the heart to the lungs. The job of the lungs is to drop off the carbon dioxide in the blood and to pick up oxygen from the lungs. This blood is oxygen poor or deficient, sometimes called deoxygenated blood. This blood is carbon dioxide rich. We will continue to discuss this idea of oxygen and carbon dioxide as we progress to this chapter and a few more chapters. But the big picture is the blood returning to the lung, I'm sorry, the blood returning to the heart and going to the lungs 
has just been to all of your body parts, your spleen, your liver, your arms, your legs. And so the, the oxygen was dropped off to all of those cells. So now the job of the heart is to bring that blood back to the heart to send to the lungs to pick up more oxygen. When the blood dropped off the oxygen to all those cells, it picked up carbon dioxide. We are gonna breathe out carbon dioxide, which we'll discuss in the respiratory chapter, and we're gonna breathe in oxygen. Again, these, will, these themes will be discussed over the next few chapters. <clears throat> right atrium. So we're gonna begin our discussion in the right side of the heart in the top portion. The right atrium receives blood from three places. The superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and something called the coronary sinus. We will look at each of these individually on the next few slides. So the big picture is we're dumping all of the blood for our entire body, the top half of our body, the middle of our body, the lower half of our body. All that blood is pooling or getting dumped into that right atrium. So we're gonna start off with the blood coming from the top half of our body. So the word superior means above, vena is a vein. And these are a lot of Latin terms. The superior vena cava is a large vein that drains blood above the diaphragm. So these are all of the body parts, your head, your neck, your thorax, your upper limbs. So all of this blood has just returned to the heart from those body regions. The blood again is oxygen poor, carbon dioxide rich. So this blood came from the bottom or the top half of your body, and now we're going to the bottom of your body. So the inferior vena cava, inferior means below, is going to drain blood. Again, it's a vein. Veins carry blood to or towards the heart below the diaphragm. So abdominal pelvic cavity and the lower limbs. So you should recall your abdominal pelvic cavity is anywhere below your diaphragm. So stomach, liver, spleen, reproductive organs, etc. And the last place is the heart itself. The coronary sinus, which you can see in this figure, kind of almost in the center, is going to drain blood from the myocardium. The myocardium is the heart muscle. This picture, it says, is a posterior view. So now you're looking at the heart from behind. This picture is also a good indicator of where these pulmonary veins and arteries are gonna be located on the next few slides. So, so far what we've said is your right atrium is going to receive blood from above your body, superior vena cava, below your body, or below the diaphragm, inferior vena cava, and from the coronary sinus. So now all of the blood is in the right atrium. What happens next? What happens next is we're gonna flow that blood or move that blood from top to bottom. The blood is going to go, if you look at the arrows in this picture, from that right atrium to the right ventricle. There are valves involved in this process. We will look at the valves at the end of this discussion. So the right ventricle opens into the pulmonary trunk. <clears throat> Again, pulmonary means lungs. We're taking the blood to the lungs. The pulmonary trunk then splits into right and left pulmonary arteries. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Typically, arteries carry blood away from the heart and the arteries are oxygen rich. This is the one exception to that rule. In this story, the arteries are carrying blood that is oxygen poor because the blood has just returned from the body. These pulmonary arteries that split from the pulmonary trunk are right and left. The right pulmonary artery goes to the right lung. The left pulmonary artery goes to the left lung. Again, as we're discussing this, you should follow along either on the diagrams in these presentations or slides or the diagram of the heart that you should have already labeled in your PowerPoint packet. The pulmonary arteries carry blood away from the heart. So what happens next? Well, now we are in the lungs and we're gonna do gas exchange. You should recall that diffusion is the movement of substances, in this case gases, from high to low. 
So what's going to happen in the lungs is we're going to drop off the oxygen and we're going to, I'm sorry, we're going to drop off the carbon dioxide, sorry, and we're going to pick up the oxygen. Now that we have oxygen, we're going to go back to the heart. So now we're to the left side of the heart. Always right to left, always top to bottom. So now the left atrium is going to receive blood. This part of the heart is called the systemic circuit because it's going to carry blood to all of your body's systems. In other words, to all of the body. So things like the digestive system, your reproductive system, your urinary system, etc. All of these are going to receive this oxygen-rich blood from the body. This blood is oxygen-rich or oxygenated and CO2 poor. Again, when we get to respiratory, we will discuss oxygen and carbon dioxide in more depth. Left side of the heart structures. So we are now in the top half of the heart and the left atrium. The blood is again going to flow from top to bottom. The blood is going to receive or empty into this left atrium. So the left atrium has four openings called pulmonary veins. These veins are carrying blood from the lungs. Again, typically veins are oxygen poor. These veins, like the pulmonary arteries, are the opposite of the traditional setting or traditional function. These pulmonary veins are oxygen rich because they just receive blood from the lungs. The left ventricle opens into something called the aorta. The aorta is a large artery. Recall, this side of the heart's job is to take the blood to the body. It was a systemic circuit, so we're headed to the body parts. The left ventricle is thicker and contracts more forcefully and has a higher blood pressure, BP is a blood pressure, than the right ventricle. That is because when the right ventricle squeezes or contracts, its job is to push that blood up to the lungs. The lungs are in close proximity to the heart. When the left ventricle contracts, its job is to push that blood to, out to all of the body parts. That takes a lot more force. Therefore, it works harder, making it thicker. It's a muscle. It has to contract more, and it has a higher blood pressure than the right ventricle. The aorta is a large artery that carries blood from the left ventricle to the body. Again, as I'm going through this, you should follow along on the pictures. There's also animations in the animation worksheet on Blackboard and in the Connect homework that will help you understand these concepts. So before we continue on, we have to discuss valves. So at each of the junctures of the major chambers, there is a valve. Valves are structures that ensure one-way blood flow. So what that means is we are going through all of this energy to separate oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor blood and we don't want those to mix. So the valve's job is to make sure that blood is flowing in one direction to keep the oxygen poor blood from mixing with the oxygen rich blood. There are two categories or types of valves. One are called atrioventricular valves and they are between the atria and the ventricles. The other kind of valves are called semilunar, semi meaning half, lunar moon. They look kind of like a half moon. Four chambers, four valves. So let's look at the details of the valves. So the atrioventricular valves are located between the atria and the ventricles. So in other words, at the base of the right atrium, before we get to the right ventricle, is our first atrioventricular valve called the tricuspid valve, which you can see in this picture. On the left side, between the left atrium and left ventricle, there is another valve called the bicuspid or mitral valve. So the tricuspid valve is between the right atria and right ventricle, in other words, on the right side of your heart, and it is called the tricuspid valve because it has three cusps or flaps. You should recall that tri means three. The bicuspid valve or mitral valve, which are the exact same structure, are between the left atria and left ventricle, in other words, on the left side of the heart. It only has two cusps or flaps. 
It is important that these valves are going to tighten close or tighten and be closed completely. Otherwise, if you have leaky valves, the heart will not push the blood to the next chamber completely. That will be discussed in part two of the heart videos. The chordae tendinae are what we call the heart strings. Again, you can see on this picture, they are basically the tendons that are attached to these AV valve flaps, AV or atrium ventricular, and their job is to support the valves. Their job is to make sure these valves open and close sufficiently between each heart. Our next set of valves are called semilunar valves, of which again you have two. So the semilunar valves are fairly easy to understand. The pulmonary semilunar valve is at the base of the pulmonary trunk. So we basically are going to the lungs. Again, pulmonary means to the lungs. And our second semilunar valve is the aortic semilunar valve, which is the base of the aorta. So at each major junction in the heart, there is a valve regulating the control of the valve flaps and the control of blood flow. It should be noted, which we will discuss further, that the valves, all four of them, are not open at the same time. They open in pairs. In other words, when the two AV valves are open, the semilunars are closed. When the semilunars are open, the AV valves are closed. Again, we will discuss this further on the next few slides and the next presentation. So now let's put this all together. It is crucial that you understand the blood flow to the heart. Every student, every person has a different way to do this. One of the ways is you can draw the heart, you can label all the structures, and then number them. So number one would start with that right atrium. Another option, which we will see on the next few slides, is to do what's called like a flow diagram. Another option at home, which is the best option in my opinion, is to take some note cards, you can cut them in half, write down all the structures we're going to go through, and then shuffle them and put them in order, and shuffle them and put them in order. You will have to know on a test or quiz the steps of the blood flow in order, starting with the right atria. So here we go. Step one. The right atria receives blood from the superior and inferior vena cava and the coronary sinus. Blood then flows from the, tri or from the right atrium to the tricuspid valve, so we're going from top to bottom, to the right ventricle. Remember, we're headed to the lungs. Now we go pulmonary semilunar valve. Step five is the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk splits into pulmonary arteries. The left pulmonary artery will go to the, long, the left lung and the right pulmonary artery will go to the right lung. So we're halfway through, we're at the lungs. There are 14 steps total. In the lungs, we drop off and pick up carbon dioxide and oxygen. Diffusion occurs. Now we're headed back to the heart. The pulmonary veins are going to empty their oxygen-rich blood and to the left atrium. Blood again is gonna flow from top to bottom, from the left atrium through our bicuspid valve, from our bicuspid valve to our left ventricle. That left ventricle is going to squeeze. The aortic semilunar valve is going to open. We're then going to go from the aortic semilunar valve to the aorta and finally out to the body. You need to know all of the steps, 1 through 14, in this slide. You may not have to put all of them in order on a test or quiz. It may be a multiple choice or it may be fill in the blank. But these steps you will need to know in some form or fashion on a test or quiz. So before we leave part one, this is showing what I call a flow diagram. So all the structures in blue are oxygen poor are deoxygenated, and all the structures in red are oxygen rich. Well, you will notice in the middle is the lungs and the body tissues. They're kind of neutral. Again, there are animations on Blackboard and the animation worksheet that will help you understand this concept. I highly recommend that you view them. So it doesn't matter how you know these in order as long as you know them in order.